Good evening. Thank you for joining us for today's uh, Off the Stage event presented by Mbadala. My name is Michael Leo. I am the Curatorial Assistant for the NYU Radio Art Gallery. And we are delighted to host this evening's Arts Chat, Balancing Life as an Artist and an Academic, presented in collaboration with the NYU AD Art Center and the Career Development Center. This event is part of the Art Center's Off the Stage series, which includes community dinners, visits to NYU AD classes, uh, post-show Q&As, and arts chats just like this one. I would also like to mention the Art Gallery's ongoing shows, um, Horizon by Blaine de Saint Croix next door at the Art Gallery, and Salted Edges by Janet Bellotto at the Project Space in the Art Center. If you'd like to learn more about the Art Center's Off the Stage events and the Art Gallery's exhibitions, please sign up for our newsletters or visit our respective websites. And now, please welcome our esteemed panel for tonight's discussion. Miwa Matreik, um, an animator, performer, and director, and Vikram Devecha, an artist and educator. Moderating this arts chat will be Zalalam Waratu, a senior student at NYU AD. So please. Thank you all for coming here today. Super excited to have this conversation with you too, and to everyone else as well. Um, and so let's start things off with a nice introductory kind of question. I was wondering, when did you decide to pursue a career in art and academia? And if you could explain why you chose to go down this path. Niwa, would you like to start <laughs> off? Sure. Um, pursue a career in art. I think it was just something that kind of happened. Um, uh, when I was in grad school at CalArts, I was studying uh, ex experimental animation was the area that I was in. Um, so I thought it was just to make a bunch of short films and work in the animation industry. Um, but through the process of being at school, my practice opened up to incorporating performance um, as well as animation and that kind of led into this uh, uh, you know, path of uh, showing my work at performance festivals as well as film festivals and maybe arts festivals. Um, so it just kind of emerged because I came out of school with work that was already able to be toured or able to be presented. Um, with that said, after I graduated, I did work in motion graphics as a freelancer for probably five, six, seven years. Um, it was quite flexible, which worked out really well with. Um, being able to go on tour, come back, and work for a few months. Um, Ocean Graphics is doing animation for, uh, you know, commercials and music videos, so like commercial animation. Um, but that balanced really well with uh, having an art career or start, starting to build one. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so I think I didn't really believe that art career until that balance weighed more towards uh, touring and being able to support myself with mm -hmm. the income of being an artist rather than having to work commercially. Um, and for the academic part, um, I think in my mind I thought that I'd be teaching at some point, but uh, definitely the pandemic really pressed my hand um, when I lost all my touring, um, as well as becoming a mother kind of changed the, the math of how I, uh, you know, live my life <laughs> and uh, being able to support myself. Um, so those are kind of, yeah, just shifting life kind of led me to more, but pushed me more towards uh, teaching sooner than later, I think. Thank you for sharing. Thank you. And Vikram, how about you? Yeah, uh, I think similar in my case as well, it didn't happen together. Um, I think around, almost a decade ago, I was uh, working in Dubai in, 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 in media and writing and a bit of filmmaking experience from Bombay. And uh, I made a shift towards uh, being an artist in the UAE, which was, you know, I had no clue what I was uh, jumping into. Um, at that point, but uh, I developed some ideas and some questions. I feel they still sort of in some way uh, perhaps haunt me, you know, and, and I keep coming back to those questions. And so uh, at that point, I kept working as a part-time, you know, uh, sort of, uh, you know, I had part-time gigs within Dubai and uh, I would sort of release myself for say six to seven hours a day and dedicate with this make art and a lot of my work has been trying to engage with the city um, and alongside what happened was that there were all these initiatives in and, and my career sort of took off I, I, you know like things were happening in the UAE the institutions there were um, different platforms to showcase work and alongside there were these initiatives such as Campus Art Dubai 
um, I suggest the Tashkil, the Critical Practice Program, or even uh, Tashika Salama uh, Emerging Artist Program, and I got involved with those. And uh, what happened was I started engaging with a lot of uh, thinkers, academics, scholars, um, and that uh, expanded my idea of what is art making. Um, I would like to mention someone like Deborah Levine, who was teaching at NYUAD in 2016. She was a mentor for a program back um, in 2016 through Tashkil. In fact, it was Maya Alice who said, you must go and meet Deborah Levine, and I just met her, and we hit it off, and we're still in a long conversation around uh, you know, what it means to make art. So there are still projects since 2013 or 16 that I'm still shaping. I'm still trying to work on a film um, that the seeds of which were, were established by a small grant in 2016. And right now, I'm in conversation with multiple people from different disciplines to expand what it means to, uh, to pursue that project. Um, and I feel that sort of has led me to think about that art making cannot be isolated from the various fields. Mm -hmm. um, and then somewhere in 2017, I, I sort of got a scholarship, I could do my MFA. And, uh, and over time I've realized is that uh, to be an artist also, uh, it encompasses not just you know uh, making art, but it encompasses thinking, teaching. Uh, a lot of the people that inspire me are, are educators because they are in a sense still students, right? And, and learning happens in the classroom uh, for the professor, learning happens for me in every other location. So I feel like in a sense, Emerging academia and art making is expanding my art practice. I do not sort of think about it separately. And perhaps I've been fortunate enough to, to meet uh, or like have a few mentors in my life who have been really selfless. And hopefully, uh, hopefully I can also in some way, you know, uh, take that tradition ahead. Um, yeah, if that answers the question. It does. Thank you very much. Um, I was wondering, have you ever? happen to encounter a challenge when pursuing your career in art making as well as like in academia? And like if so, like how did you overcome this challenge perhaps? So it's there's a challenge almost every day, I feel that. <laughs> yeah. uh, I mean I don't know how to start, but you know, uh, you're opening up like a big box. But 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 in a sense, at least what I'm trying to do is is trying to like right now I'm trying to uh, extract a wall, uh, a complete wall from a graveyard in, in Sharjah. And so I'm trying to negotiate with the municipality mm -hmm. and I'm trying to, and that's in Sharjah. In fact, yesterday morning at 6 a.m. I was in Sharjah then I came to teach in Abu Dhabi. So even that is another issue. But beyond that, it is how do you um, uh, sort of convince or involve people mm -hmm. into an art making process. And that's an ongoing challenge for me. You know, how do I find participants who want to not just involve themselves as collaborators, but become aesthetic participants in the making of the work and take authorship of that? So you need to make time, first of all, uh, to involve people. And so for me, that's a challenge. Uh, beyond that, uh, a lot of my work is experimental. So how do I also financially balance my life? Living in the UAE is extremely expensive. So I have to, so teaching for me is also uh, a way to sustain myself. I do not want to go back to, um, you know, working in the corporate world, but that was actually much more secure because I would get my paycheck at the end of the month. But as a professor, you know, you sort of get reviewed or you know the challenges that happen. So that also is keeps me, you know, um, on my toes. Uh, so it is a difficult, uh, it's a difficult, uh, you know, endeavor um, to to balance this, you know. But uh, but that's what I'm focused on. That's what I'm genuinely inclined to work, so I just, you know, uh, take myself over there. And meanwhile, have you encountered similar challenges, or have they been quite different? Um, yeah, I've, I'm not sure how long you've been, like, teaching and kind of balancing, because mm -hmm. for me it's fairly new. I started Same about, there. okay, about two mm -hmm. years ago. Okay. <laughs> um, and I had kind of done workshops and stuff before that I've never just like fully immersed in the institution teaching um, challenges. I think that uh, for myself, um, art making is really healing and self-affirmative and makes me feel a spark of excitement, makes me feel magical. Um, I'm not sure this is something that um, necessarily other artists feel, but uh, and I think the challenge has been that I haven't 
been able to feel that spark because I'm pretty loaded with teaching. Again, for it to be new and kind of like developing curriculum, developing ways that I want to teach in the classroom, um, as well as all the administrative stuff. It is very time consuming. Every, every night I have to, you know, after, uh, you know, we do dinner time, bath time, bedtime with my daughter. It's like the last like 10 to 1 a.m. is some, it's like kind of dedicated to, you know, so there's like no space for me to feel very magical about mm -hmm. myself or have the time to tinker and experiment. Um, so that's been challenging. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, the summer is meant to be like the research term, um, but I did teach last summer, so I kind of gave up that time. Um, so I think I, I think there there's like multiple things happening because you know I moved from Los Angeles to Vancouver to teach. I lost my community and trying to connect to a new community, um, and then of course having a child and having this career change are kind of like multiple things that happen at once for me. So I think that it's, I'm still taking the time to adjust and sort out how I feel about how everything is like falling into place. Yeah. yeah. That makes me wonder, like, what were perhaps like some important skills or kind of concepts that were instilled in you while you were a student, perhaps, that mm -hmm. have kind of helped you pursue an independent career as an artist? Mm -hmm. It's relatively new. Mm -hmm. What do you find yourself going back to? Um, I feel like I keep going back to, again, like this kind of feeling of just tinkering. Just, um, I, I really loved as an artist before I had a kid, before I had like much responsibilities of just like deciding that I'm going to stay up all night and like work on this something and like, you know, that excitement and that energy that you get just from making work. Mm -hmm. um, and I love reconnecting with that feeling when I get that chance. Um, of course, it's a bit further in between. But I, I do love that sometimes I see that in the classroom when uh, students are collaborating and you know, there's that like, oh, what if we do this? What if we try this? What if we do this? And how that kind of propels people forward. Um, I really love that energy. And it, it is exciting to see that happen in the classroom or um, to kind of help facilitate that and support it. Do you also find yourself tinkering or sparking that kind of curiosity to keep producing artworks or finding new subjects, perhaps? Yeah, I mean, I love the word tinkering. Yeah. Yeah, that's a, I'm going to borrow that. Um, <laughs> um, but yeah, I feel that, uh, I mean, on a similar note, I feel that what I've realized over time is that, uh, that uh, as an artist, we have the right to make mistakes. We have the right to try out things, and we shouldn't fear that. And in a sense, we need to protect that space, you know, that uh, this is a place to experiment, uh, or even the classroom is where, um, you know, uh, uh, we, we set up a few sort of rules, but then uh, that opens up all these possibilities, you know, where, where, where someone can go with a small project or a larger project. Um, so that's something that I, I think that I haven't actually learned in my earlier education, because uh, it was, I think, fairly rigorous and I was always rebelling against it but um, that's a perhaps a life you have sort of developed over time um, but to go back to the question about what have I learned in, in, in my education was a certain uh, rigor mm -hmm. right that uh, that you need to sort of know at least the medium or respect the medium um, have discipline uh, in terms of time and investment to to sort of uh, you know uh, to look into something very deeply and, and once you sort of have that base, then you also want to learn how to free yourself from it. But you always have that access to go back to, if not those skill sets, but a certain rigor. Um, and, and yeah, I like this idea about how, uh, in a sense, when we think about improvisation, if you think about tinkering as improvisation, um, you know, improvisation is, improvisation is best done when you already have a certain uh, grasp of a medium, right? Mm -hmm. So it's only then can you get be, can, it's only then can you be released from the rigor, you mm -hmm. know. And so that's what I seek for, I think, you know. And I feel that uh, different forms of education and, and sort of experiences have uh, made me aware about how do I come to that position as an artist where you know uh, you can tinker with some kind of grace, you know. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, <laughs> why would you do it? Mm -hmm. I see. Okay, and. Um, how 
would you say you kind of adapt your teaching methods to accommodate students, perhaps, who may not have a strong background in the arts, but seem to have that curiosity or interest in exploring their creative side a bit more? How do you kind of cultivate that spirit within them? I mean, and this again is lovely, which is one of the courses I teach, um, which is called City to Studio, is at least spending the first semester um, acquainting yourself um, with, uh, say, a site, mm -hmm. right? But then the, the classroom is uh, open to students from different, you know, um, uh, different programs from, say, uh, social policy to economics to, to visual arts to filmmaking. Um, and I feel that uh, what's important is that you produce certain questions and themes that, that echo in the classroom. Right, so that, that is important that they all are leaning, if not in the same direction, but there's a similar gist happening. Um, and so then when you produce your work, and if somebody else produces work, you, you, can, uh, you can critique it not just through like your skill set of say filmmaking or say social policy, but you can actually think about it or, or have constructive feedback which uh, comes from the knowledge of that site already. So in some sense, we, 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 I try to create experiences which are shared, right? And once you produce that, at least for that phase of the semester, the students are bound by some shared experience. Um, and that's, that's what I, guess I try to uh, inculcate in classes which are fairly experimental. Uh, but classes which are like off, off, you know, sort of rigor and technique, you know, it's important that we, we sort of share work every week and, and just collectively look at where is a class going, you know. So, uh, yeah, I guess the idea is that, you know, you don't want to work in isolation. And sometimes classrooms can be isolating, but how do you always keep in, involved is, is, I think, the strategy to, um, to get everyone a little more invested, a little more aware also, the whereas when they push the artwork or the assignment. Um, I'm teaching a first year class right now and I feel like um, I feel like often I end up kind of being in a more facilitator role after I give them a prompt to just kind of keep supporting their questions and supporting things that could be in the mix in the classroom and I really think of play as research that uh, in a, especially in a collaboration a state of playfulness is what kind of opens up to more possibilities. Um, uh, I always say like silly is great, like get silly because I think there's so much discovery that happens from trying an idea that like, you know, they might be kind of afraid to do or think that it's, it's kind of dumb, but then, you know, when they actually start putting things together, it might turn into something else um, that's actually like a fascinating jumping off point into something much bigger. Um, so again, I, I think of like play as research and really kind of creating a space for that. It's like here's a bunch of stuff, just start messing around and see what emerges and then see how you can like uh, add more complexity and kind of evolve what you discover from there. Um, would you say that's how you kind of found your voice as an artist? Perhaps? Uh, yeah, I would say so, yeah. Um, Especially with my theater company, it's really just like we go into a dark room, we just drag a bunch of cardboard and stuff from the dumpster and like start projecting onto it and see what happens, you know? Um, so I think that kind of ethos of play and being silly, being okay with being silly was definitely a part of it. Um, and yeah, I think that play and tinkering, kind of problem solving are like kind of the, the threads that run through in my work as well. Where did you kind of find your voice as an artist? Just speaking because mm -hmm. I'm an artist myself, or I like to think of myself as an artist, mm -hmm. and so it's quite hard to kind of figure out, well, what should I follow? Mm -hmm. I suppose, again, yeah, it's a great question because yeah, I remember like I was I was making art for a couple of years, and I was like, am I an artist? You know, and I remember having a conversation with someone. No, but you are an artist now. Like you know, <laughs> um, there is like you have made a body of work, and. Uh, um, and so I mean, I made a turn in my life from, say, a corporate career towards a media career towards being an artist. Um, so I think I, I mean I found the voice through 
uh, a community where we would share work uh, and the community would, would critique it, you know, uh, constructive. Sometimes also it could sort of, you know, pinch you a little bit. Um, um, but I felt like that those spaces where, where you could, you know, uh, share your work, uh, you know, and feel safe, um, and also get feedback, um, perhaps uh, sort of opens up that you know what is it that the work is doing. Um, and there was a very interesting text I read, and, and I hope I have a longer career as an artist, because what they said was what this person said was that often artists come back to the same questions. Like they, they don't even realize it, but they just keep coming back, keep coming back. There's a certain kind of, you know, the word that I'm going to use is haunting, but it sounds a bit odd, but, but that you come back to these themes or questions that, you know, and, and I think over time, uh, you know, I've come to identify that and unknowingly I return to those. Um, but also because people are giving feedback, people are talking about your work, writing about your work. Um, yeah, I think that's how I came to understand, you know, uh, that you know, what is my voice, but what's the voice of the artwork? Because they're two separate things, I feel. You know, I, I feel like what the work is doing is different, perhaps, from, you know, well, what is my intent? You know, uh, there is a separation between that. Uh, so, it's, so, yeah, that's where I would say that they, what is my voice, perhaps, is not even also important because. Eventually, it's the artwork which needs to make a relationship with the audience. That's that's perhaps why great artworks continue to remain in collections because the work still speaks with people. Right? So even if you look at a lot of uh, old school aesthetic, a lot of aesthetic theories, like there's one thing about uh, the artist's relationship with the artwork, but the relationship of the artwork with the audience is is much more important. So I feel there's there's two voices out here, you know that. Uh, I've started to think about in a way rather than just with my voice. Um, I feel like for myself, and I was talking about kind of not feeling that spark, um, I feel like I feel the most happy when I'm completely immersed in the art making. And art making might be, well, I'm not sure if I consider my art to be art with a capital A, even when I'm showing stuff that's like, you know, presented. Um, but often art making could be like putting on a dinner party or making a, a weird costume that I forced my friend to wear for their birthday or you know like um, I, I think there's a form of like gift giving that's part of my practice like I, I feel like even like the, the like the, the presentations that I'm going to do in the Red Theater there's a sense of like tinkering and building this thing until I like get to present it and it's almost like this gift giving kind of energy for me. And there's a way that that kind of gets satisfied by putting on uh, dinner parties and like doing a puppet show for my birthday for everyone else. Um, so I think those are even just like a nurturing thing for me um, that I haven't gotten to do <laughs> in my new life. Um, yeah, and I think also like kind of speaking about uh, how my art practice was so kind of part of my life uh, previously before teaching and before a child. Um, because I lived kind of in a uh, live-work space, so there was like no separation between just like rolling out of bed and making animation and testing stuff and then going on a hike and coming back and um, and you know I I actually because I had a kind of a live-work space or it just means I had a giant living room and like in a lucky lucky break um, I often did studio visits, but basically I just invite people who were in town from all over the world and just invite them to the living room, give them a private show, and like bake cookies. And you know, that was always like uh, such a healing, exciting experience for me. Um, and something that I've been trying to reconnect to. The fact that your art is kind of helping you create a community. Mm -hmm. That's beautiful. I've never. I don't know, I'm always kind of like scared to kind of show my artwork. Oh yeah, like but I feel like for me, it feels like, I don't feel like I've been seen in my true self unless I've shared mm. art with them. That's a good way of looking at it. Um, so I'm curious, what kind of, you mentioned that there weren't any kind of divisions between like your work as well as like your living space, I suppose. And so with that, I'm curious like, what role kind of what kind of role did academia or perhaps like your research or your tinkering kind of play into your decision making kind of 
touched upon that. Decision you, making into what? Um, your artworks and like oh. your performances. Um, Have they influenced each other perhaps? Um, somewhat. I feel like um, by the nature of my work, which is kind of between kind of film, film, video, animation, and theater performance, and kind of a little bit into a new media realm, depending on who's um, sharing my work, that I was often uh, shown by university presenters too. So I feel like I was always kind of traversing in this space of talking about, about my work in those kinds of contexts. Um, so I feel like, uh, and, and, and also kind of like having to define my work or talk about my work. So I think that kind of like always kind of grounded me in, um, yeah, just the uh, things just having to talk about my work, feeling like uh, I had something to offer into a teaching position. And uh, mm -hmm. Krom, what role do you kind of see academia kind of playing in your creative work as well in making it? Um, I, I think a couple of things. I think some of the projects I'm pursuing actually interest uh, certain researchers. Mm -hmm. um, uh, unknowingly, like some of my work is, like initially unknowingly it was uh, ethnographic uh, because I engage with communities. Um, so that sort of got me involved with a few scholars, how they, how they engage. Um, so I think that, that informs me as one way of thinking about it. But the other hand, uh, I think I answered this earlier, is that I, uh, as I shape projects, um, uh, well, I th it's more like you know an inquiry. There's a so there was this Indian filmmaker called Mani Call. He's a very important uh, Indian filmmaker, and he spoke about how uh, back then in the 70s there was this fund from uh, the Indian National Board to make films, and he says you would just go over there with a one-page synopsis of this is what I want to, this is the film I want to make about. That I want to make a film about, um, you know, uh, people who work with clay in villages in India. Mm -hmm. There wasn't a script, there wasn't a storyboard, there wasn't a certain, uh, you know, exact uh, definition of what the work is going to be. And then he would go out there with a team and he would make an inquiry of the people and their lives mm -hmm. and then make a work. And I find, so I think that I, I really echoed with that sort of little anecdote he told in his interview because in a sense I'm also trying to uh, make an inquiry about the world. Um, and when I make an inquiry about the world, uh, there's already uh, a lot of knowledge about uh, different things out there. So then I involve academics to sort of unpack that world for me from their lenses as well. Um, and perhaps when you do it together, they also learn, or they also kind of some certain parts of my research, which is our field research, uh, sort of informs their practice as researchers mm -hmm. and scholars. So I think there's sort of a mutually beneficial uh, space opening up uh, on the periphery of the project of how I'm engaging with, say, people from the different professors and why you're right now I'm engaging for this one wall project of thinking about what does it mean to pull out the wall right now. I don't have the right answer. I'm doing it. But what it means will only be revealed as I do it and as I engage with people. Um, and that those could be from demolition contractors to professors over here. Um, so yeah, that's how uh, I find uh, trying to make an inquiry as, a, as not a group exactly, but by being in conversation with, with multiple you know, thinkers, uh, important and interesting of what, what else can an art practice be. On that note mm -hmm. about inquiry mm -hmm. and communicating with others, I'm going to open the floor <laughs> to our audience. Do you guys have any questions for our panelists? I do, actually. Um, so you're, I love the way you're describing the making processes as a process of discovery and not knowing, right? So I have some idea of what I want to do, but, I'm, but it is the doing that is the, that is the thing. How do you square that with a culture, a, a social uh, set of norms that look for certainty, that look for outcomes. And I guess tied into the question is a question of, of assessment too. Right? How do you know 
and I know this is different for everybody, but how do you determine when you, how do you measure when the work is successful and or, um, well, and how do you communicate that to, to students? Mm -hmm. um, so I think that there are two questions. One is about my art practice and one is about classroom. Um, I feel what's interesting with UAE right now is that um, in the last 10 years, there's been a lot of support for artists to, to produce work. And uh, I feel up to now, this place is fairly open to try out things. So there isn't a, a certainty of what this artwork needs to do. There are curators and, and such who want a very sort of, uh, you know, uh, completely fine-tuned proposal. On the other hand, all, they are also open to um, supporting experiments. And I feel that uh, that's a space right now that's available in the UAE. It would be perhaps different. Like I was living in New York for a few years and studying out there, and I did sense that there has to be an articulation of what the proposal is. So already the person on the other hand knows where I'm heading. You know, it needs to be aligned in terms of concept, themes, culture. Um, and I found that limiting. That's why I couldn't even stay back out there because uh, I, I want to try out things, you know. Um, and this place allows that. Or at least, at least in my case, it's, uh, it's been, uh, I've managed to kind of find that space for me. For example, I did a project for the Sharjah Bayani in 2017. And the project did not take off at the Bayani. You know, it was a farming project with a few municipal gardeners and we didn't get sweet water at the roundabout. So we refused to start the project. But the biennial supported me and the project finally took life in 2019 at the other biennial. And the project has really echoed a lot with so many people, uh, which is a success of it, but it wasn't successful as an image. Uh, like in 2017, there wasn't an image that people would click on Instagram. Right? But it was successful in terms of how it generated conversations, uh, it made future collaborations for me possible. Um, and so that's how at least I try and work. I'm not so bothered about delivering what the institution wants. And that's a resistance we need to develop as, as, as artists. And so to come back, how it happens in the classroom is, is that what I tell my, some of my students is, that, you know what, I'm, I'm going to grade you, uh, because everyone's concerned about grades. Um, he said, I'm going to grade you, I don't mind, I, I, I will grade you, I will start grading you if you do not try things, right? I want you to try things and you can fail, as you mentioned, you know, that, but I want you to try things, if you fail, that's fine. Do not be bothered about that part, you know. This is a classroom to try out things, exactly as, as Mio mentioned. And so, uh, we need to open up that space for them, where they do not fear you know, trying out things. And, and by keeping the end result uncertain or, or sort of abstract, I feel is important. Because if I'm saying this is the kind of painting rigor I expect from you, then you already know you cannot match up to it. But if you make an assignment where people um, can go where they want to, uh, I think that's a step. How do you open up that space? It, it's just difficult, you know, it doesn't always work out. Uh, but yeah, that's like last semester, there was a student from economics who really did a beautiful work at the end of it. I mean, she shone from, she, she, was, she shined the way I didn't expect the, at, at the class, but she was really sort of, you know, trying out things. You know. uh, there was no material <laughs> provided, nothing, but she hustled her way through the school and found what she wanted. And she, she did something successful. But the fear of uh, not failing is important, yeah. I think in, here, as it's allowing Tests. A lot of our students are very conscious of uh, performance mm -hmm. and, and standards, and, and so I think the heavy lift is creating a space where they trust that right, they can tinker and explore. And cultural shift often has to happen. And from Los Angeles, and oh. I had the chance a number of years ago to see some of your work at the Red Cat oh. Theater. And I've been really, I've, I think that probably anyone who's a parent can relate very much to what you're saying about these balances and these transformations and these uh, moments of creativity versus all these other responsibilities and these different types of time. When I went to see your performance at the Red Cat, 
one of the people in the audience was a, a curator friend of mine from LACMA, and she had brought her very young daughter to uh, the presentation. And uh -huh. It was a really little kid, and who was kind of sitting on her mom's lap and watching this and, and really enjoying this. And so I was wondering if you might flip around this issue of, of what it means to combine all of these aspects of your world and think about or reflect upon, or if you could reflect upon your work as it relates to questions that you talk about tinkering, but, but maybe play or, or, or childhood or uh -huh. not just as children as your audience, but even the, the ways in which you are creating. I'm curious mm -hmm. about how that plays into your work. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um. Yeah, I mean, like I said, you know, often I, I feel like it's hard for me to kind of draw a distinction. Like, whatever that kind of sparks excitement is like what I want to follow that leads into work or different levels of. And I feel like there's like, you know, kind of the, the bigger pieces that I work on for a year and a half or two years that, you know, gets presented versus. Um, uh, a little puppet show video that is just sent to my friend, um, and I, uh, I feel like there, if the spark is there, the drive it, like the desire and like the, the the need that I feel to make it is like kind of equally there. Um, and with the uh, again, kind of like the, the shift in how I can like balance the number of hours in a day and dedicate it towards dedicate anything towards making has shifted into uh, doing more things, uh, this smaller scale of course, but also like more hands-on for me, um, like uh, making an installation with, uh, with a cutout paper, with like a, a hundred cutout paper flowers that's uh, on a rotating table and creating these uh, landscapes of uh, shadows um, is something that I did as a, like a, a small show at my at my school, um, so I, I think there there has been like kind of a, a shift in scale and shift in like uh, in working with my hands versus more digitally. Um, I'm not sure if I'm answering your question, <laughs> but I, I think I am trying to find different outlets or different ways to kind of satisfy that that need and feel like I'm still producing something at different scales. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. And any last burning questions, perhaps, amongst the students, maybe, or former students? Um, I do have a question. I'm not sure if that's very related to what we were talking about before, but um, to what degree of like the academic academic work, um, do you think we can go, um, so basically the situation is like I'm a uh, senior right now and I'm looking at the graduate program and the one that I really want to go to, they, they don't have the master program, they don't have PhD and then I, I, I came here also because I feel like that was like a very interesting like, intersection of like academia and arts but then I feel like PhD sounds like something that goes a little bit too deep into academia, especially when I came from like a more like practical art perspective, like um, background, because I studied film production at uh, New York campus. So like, do you have any s suggestions on like s kind of like switching to academia, or like, do you think it's a worth trying to like really try to reach the PhD level? Because that's. <laughs> <laughs> That's a tough thing to do. <laughs> yeah. um, I mean, I, I, mean uh, I don't have a PhD, um, but I know of friends mm -hmm. who, who do uh, an art practice PhD. So it's, your PhD is partly practice and partly theory. It's not complete theory. Mm -hmm. um, I think a lot of those schools are in Europe from what I understand. Mm -hmm. um, and I feel that some educators want to go that length, uh, mm -hmm. you know. Um, so I think that's if, you, that's if your interest in filmmaking is from a specific area, um, 
of, of merging theory and practice, then you want to look into that. But yeah, uh, it's, 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 it's a big investment. I'm also curious if you're, you have a desire to teach, uh, and that's why you want to go. That's the thing. I don't, I don't really think I want to go to teaching. Oh, then. The, yeah. the, the only problem is I want to <laughs> do that program, but then I realize I don't have a master degree. I see. And I'm graduating from a bachelor. I don't need another bachelor degree, so. Yeah. That's, that's really frustrating, I guess. Yeah, so I feel like um, like getting the higher degrees. I mean, definitely for teaching, you need at least you know like a master's degree, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. So I do think that if there's an, a possibility of teaching, uh, getting that is important. Um, I feel like with PhD, sometimes it can even back high, uh, backfire in, in terms of. Um, getting into teaching because um, I've seen a lot of applications, well now that I'm the admin side of the university, um, like for uh, searches for positions that people with PhDs can have like a very, 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 very specific background that actually is like, not doesn't seem as broad and exciting as some people who are more, more practicing artists and not like kind of hardened into like theory. Um, so again, I think it depends on what you want to do, but if that program's exciting to you, then it sounds like it'd be interesting, for sure. Thank you. All right, if that is all, <laughs> thank you guys so, so much. Thank you, panelists. Thank you. Your thank you. responses were really insightful and I think inspiring. And yeah, so I hope you all are excited and want to go see Mila's performances. <laughs> She's showing um, tomorrow as well as Friday and Saturday. Um, if you don't have tickets already, please go to the Art Center website and book them there. We hope to see you guys there. And then definitely look into Professor Vikram and look into his website and maybe go see his work that's showcasing <laughs> in the UAE. And yeah, thank you guys so much. Thank you.